Good morning and welcome to Park Road Baptist Church. It is good to be worshiping together this day. For those of you here in the room and for all of those joining us online, we welcome you as well. Thank you to Chris White for our music before worship this morning to help us take that deep breath and enter into this time and this space together. Let me make just a few announcements for you. Last night we hosted Room in the Inn. We had 12 uh, women as our guests and uh, we had dinner and uh, Jimmy Neal and I prepared dinner and we had several people there serving. Darren Gant took one for the team and stayed for the night and is here this morning to tell about it. So good for you Darren Gant. I hope that means you got some sleep last night. But there's still an opportunity to volunteer. Uh, laundry should be out on the sidewalk as you make your way to the back parking lot. Take a load of laundry home and get it back to us within two weeks. And uh, we'll be ready for our next turn to host. Um, young adults, and you know if you fall into this category. And if you're not sure, you probably do. So if you're a young adult and want to go to lunch together, Tom Ladane will meet you right uh, out in Held Hall or right out the back door to go to lunch together uh, after worship today. Also right after worship today, our deacons will have a brief meeting in Held Hall to uh, get started with this new year with a new group of deacons, make family assignments. Uh, it will not last long because there's no food and we're gonna need to have lunch soon. So Greg promises it won't uh, last very long. Um, Today, also after, there's just so much happening right after worship. Children and families are having lunch together. I think the plan had been to do something fun outside and outside is not cooperating. So luckily we have a gym. So meet uh, Joey and Liza right after church in the gym. There's lunch and you can play together and get, spend some time together and get to know each other uh, today right after church. Um, Joey also said, make an announcement that we're trying to get basketball together for Friday mornings at 6.15 in the morning. I heard that chuckle and I second that chuckle. <laughs> I am amazed, bewildered, but if you want to play basketball at 6 o'clock, 6.15 on Friday mornings, this is for anybody, right? Any, everybody. Russ, are you going? <laughs> I don't understand that, but good for you, Joey. 6.15, Friday mornings, meet Joey and talk to Joey so he'll know that it's coming. Um, next Sunday is Youth Sunday. Our preachers will be Alex Britton and Duncan Smith, and the youth will be leading all of worship. Um, and so I hope you will be here next week to support our young people and hear what they have to tell us from their perspective about faith and church and why it all matters to them and to us. And then on Wednesday, we do begin our Lenten journey this Wednesday for Ash Wednesday. We will not have food, no supper, but six o'clock in the sanctuary, we will have a worship service. We will. Um, participate in the imposition of ashes, and so we look forward to being together. If you'll remember last year, it was a drive-through with Q-tips, and it left something to be desired, but it was good that we could do something, and this year we're gonna be back to much more normal. Um, I see that some of you are wearing masks, and some of you are not wearing masks. We have moved with the county to mask optional, so you do what is right for you. I will say that um, if you're wondering about for the Ash Wednesday service, I'm sure the staff will be wearing masks as you come forward um, to uh, receive ashes. So if that's something that, I don't want people to like not come or be anxious because you don't feel safe getting close to, to us at least. At least in here we can spread out a little bit, but we will be wearing masks um, for those of us participating in that serve, for leading in that service next week. Also, many of you have joined up. I think I'm right at about 50 people that have wanted to join in with the Good Enough Lenten um, series. I've tried to offer as many avenues into this uh, Lenten journey. It's for men and women, not just women. But the book is called Good Enough by Kate Bowler. It's a Lenten uh, devotional uh, series and uh, a book to read a couple of pages every day if you want to just read it and let me know we're reading it together great there'll be a t 
Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock Zoom call about it. There'll be a Facebook group you'll be invited to uh, join if you want to have online conversation. And if you want to do none of that but just come to a potluck because you read the book at the week after Christmas, there'll be a potluck at our house. So there are all kind of ways. I would love to know if you're reading it with me and you can get information about it. I'll have a group email list. There's a sign-up sheet in, the, in Health Hall or you can text me, email me, call me, and I'll sign you up. Oh, that was a lot. So take a deep breath and enter into this moment as we worship God together in spirit and in truth.
Please read with me the litany of worship. The glory of God transfigures the everyday. At the heights of our worship, may God's presence shine through the commonplace. May God's light, shining in the face of Christ, illumine all of our days. Coming through the week uh, we've just been through on the world stage in Ukraine, I am struck by how much the affairs of nations are influenced by the inherent misguided drives of individuals in power. We, as members of our society, have limited influence as individuals. As Christians, as good neighbors, which we here at Park Road Baptist strive to be, I think we need to keep in mind that cultures outside of our own are not our enemies, even in these trying times. Most often, the situation is out of their control as well. That thought process brought, me to, uh, brought to my mind a prayer that I shared here some years ago. It was written and translated by a Lakota Sioux chief named Yellow Lark in 1877. Consider that, a Lakota Sioux chief in 1877, a society that was in the midst of a culture war that would change his people's world forever. Listen to his words of prayer and see how little animus they contain. Listen and see if these words don't mirror the words that we revere, how much we, he sounds like us. Pray with me. O oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the wind, whose breath gives life to all the world. Hear me, I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made and my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise that I may understand the things that you have taught my people. Help me to remain calm and strong in the face of all that comes towards me. Let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Help me seek pure thoughts and act with the intention of helping others. Help me find compassion without empathy overwhelming me. I seek strength, not to be greater than my brother, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes. So when life fades as the fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Lord, just as our friend Chief Yellow Lark prayed to you many years ago in the words of his culture, we come to you in the words of our culture given to us by Jesus Christ. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. A few years ago, the op-ed columnist David Brooks, op-ed columnist for the New York Times, was speaking at Myers Park Baptist and to the Charlotte community. I heard him at the Bojangles Coliseum, and he began by laughing about being the longtime conservative voice at the New York Times. It's been a lonely place, he smiled, and everyone laughed. But Brooks has had something of a conversion. Now for today, I'll call it a transformation. I don't really know where he stands politically, if he would still call himself a conservative. I don't really care. What's interesting to me is not his partisanship, but his spirituality. And he has definitely had a conversion of spirit. David Brooks was raised Jewish, but he has been drawn to Christianity. I don't know what he considers himself today. But if you read him now, you'll read a lot more about spirit than politics 
And lots of quotations you'll hear in his writing from C.S. Lewis and Henry Nouwen, from Christian theologians and mystics. He writes often about transformation. Our Thursday morning study group is reading his book called The Second Mountain, in which he describes the two mountains that so many people climb, the first being the mountain of financial and career success, building a family, building a career, building a, a successful life, successful in the eyes of society. And then for many people, Brooks says, something happens. Maybe it's success itself and people have time in their successful life to finally sit back and to think about what's really important and how they want to spend the rest of their life running the rat race or doing something else. Or maybe it's a crisis of some kind, a crisis in career or family or health. Whatever it is, Brooks says many people start climbing a second mountain not based on financial success, approval of friends, the markers of American capitalism and U.S. cultural identity. The second mountain is a spiritual climb. You don't have to be particularly religious to understand Brooks's language. I think he is speaking to Christians and Jews and people of no faith about the second mountain, this climbing, climbing up this road to things that are real and lasting. It's a great read, but it's making me wonder if that first mountain is actually necessary at all. I mean, why do you have to seek success in the eyes of the world before you can start doing what's really important? What if you started a business career and in, in, in interested not in making money, but in serving people? What if you started out in life thinking of the life of the Spirit whether you're 25 or 85, wouldn't that make sense? Are you climbing the first mountain? Why? Or have you gotten to the top of that mountain and you're just sitting on the porch enjoying the view? Why quit climbing? Jesus beckons us to the second mountain, which he says is really the only mountain. It's the mountain of transformation, a mountain that transforms all of our values, all of our values. You can still be successful, but why wait to be spiritual about it? Let us keep silence together. Now let us pray together this prayer of confession. Forgive us, O God, when we stumble in the darkness and turn away from your face. Strengthen us to walk in your brightness and live in your ways. Enlighten the shadows that keep us from growing in your love and light. Shower us with your grace that we might shine as your people upon this earth. No matter where you find yourself in life at this moment, climbing the mountain, sitting on the porch enjoying the view, still climbing, know that you are loved, you are forgiven, so be at peace. Today in the liturgical year, it is Transfiguration Sunday. We read the text from Luke's Gospel. 
Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions are weighed, were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The one of the companion texts in today's lectionary reading is from 2 Corinthians 13. Paul's words as he's reflecting on this story, 2 Corinthians 13, chapter 3, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and all of us are being transformed into God's image from one degree of glory to another. You've heard the ancient story. I'm going to call Joey Haynes up and put him in the hot seat over here. Let me let him talk to him, to, to him for just a few minutes. We got to know Joey about eight years ago, and it's been a wonderful journey for all of us together. Our young people love Joey. Our old people love Joey. Amy and I love Joey, and uh, we're glad to have him today. And Joey, we're going to begin, just like we begin every week, by asking you to introduce yourself. So go back to the beginning and give us the three-minute version of the life history of Joey Haynes. Three minutes. Three minutes is all you got. I uh, took some bullet point notes to really, you know, keep me on task. Amy did remind me she also has a sermon to talk in, or to say, so I need to keep this short. And I also, before I begin, there's nothing more that I hate than waking up early to exercise. I promise 615 basketball will be completely worth it. So please come join me and a few others playing basketball on Friday morning. So thank you all, and uh, I appreciate being here. And I, I just also want to mention that I really appreciate hearing everyone else's stories. I think one of the, the things that I appreciate about actually being at Queens is the opportunity to just sit and hear a lot of different stories from a lot of different people from different places. And so I've appreciated these last few weeks, you know, getting to know some fellow Park Rodians a little better. So thank you all who have shared and um, continue to make this place, I think, the special place that it is. So moving on, I was born and raised in rural West Virginia. Uh, I was actually born in Fairley, West Virginia, which is in Greenbrier County. And I mention this because some of you all might be familiar with the Greenbrier Resort. Uh, the Greenbrier Resort at one place was actually a secret bunker uh, where a lot of politicians from DC were actually sort of meant to go to in case of nuclear war. Um, and so that's usually when I tell people that I'm from that area, they're like, oh, I've heard of the Greenbrier, or I've been to the Greenbrier, or have conferences at the Greenbrier. Um, and so my parents actually uh, were mostly raised in White Sulphur, which is the town that the Greenbrier is in, and I was actually raised in the next county over, Monroe County, which was much more secluded. Um, the whole county, we have no stoplights, no fast food, uh, a lot of cows, a lot of cornfields. Uh, yeah, so born and raised in Monroe County and uh, spent most of my life in, the, in a very rural Pentecostal holiness congregation with um, 
a lot of my family members as well. Uh, actually, one of those churches, there were a couple of churches that we went to and a few years ago got to take some of the youth to our tiny little um, uh, rural Pentecostal church, which was uh, fun for them to see, and also took them to the house that I was raised in, which uh, it was a house that my grandmother actually was raised in as well, and um, you actually had to walk across a swinging bridge to get to it, so you parked on one side of the creek and then, you know, walk across, and so very West Virginia. Um, <laughs> After moving. West Virginia, what? Moving on. Yeah, after West Virginia. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, after West Virginia, I ended up actually coming to Queens, uh, which is how I found, you know, came to Charlotte and still here and graduated from Queens University of Charlotte. After I graduated, uh, moved to South Korea for about a year, taught English, came back, was pretty broke, um, needed a job, and that's basically how I found Russ Namey. Tell us about that first morning. Uh, about eight years ago, we were looking for a youth minister. We had sent out word to all of our friends and Diane Mowry, who was at that time the chaplain at Queens University, texted me back and said, I've got a young man named Joey Haynes, and I don't know whether he would be interested, but he would be great if he would talk to you. So we called Joey, and we decided to meet for breakfast at Chick-fil-A across the street, and that's how it began. So tell us about that conversation. To be honest, I was in fact not very interested um, <laughs> at, at, the, at the time and, and place in my life. I was not very interested in church actually, um, but I had very little money in my bank account. Um, I intended to sort of stay in Charlotte for one year and uh, my plan was actually to go to Europe and get my master's. And, um, I was looking you know, at ancient Nordic studies in Iceland or nationalism at a school in Hungary, but I just didn't want to stay here. So when I met with Russ and Amy, it was actually, uh, well, I do need a job and money would probably be helpful. It's the perfect way to call a youth minister, somebody who's not interested in the church who just needs money. <laughs> and then who would have thought that that hour, two hour conversation would have probably be, be the most life-changing experience, I think, of my entire life. Um, and I often think back at that, our time at Chick-fil-A and, and that conversation. And I think, I don't know how Russ and Amy remember this, but I think one of my key takeaways as far as, oh, wow, this is an interesting place that you all work at, or church, I sort of went through a, a short list of all my concerns and hesitancies with the church, capital C Church, and all of the ways in which I sort of looked at the church and was like, it's just not what I, I just am not connecting very well. And went through a long list thinking, there are two pastors at a church, it probably is not gonna go very well for me. And they both looked at me and said, we agree. And that was a pretty instrumental, significant moment, I think, in my life because it was the first time that I, I heard, you know, two leaders in a church express doubt, concerns, sort of these, these issues that the church is not addressing, that they're like, yeah, we, we also think that that is true. And so I think just sort of having that affirmation, having that validation of concern that so often I felt like Christians didn't express and these two leaders did, I was like, this is interesting in a different place. And near the end of the conversation, uh, I remember, distinctly remember Amy saying, also, you know, we, we recognize that you were raised in a very different tradition and uh in rural west virginia and the pentecostal tradition that, but we do want you to know that we are an open and welcoming and affirming church which means we do allow all people regardless of um sexual identity sexuality um and that we actually in fact uh had a same-sex union at park road we just want to make sure that you are comfortable with that because this is who we are. 
And I was just flabbergasted. I was like, a church exists that people can come and be who they are? And I was just stunned. And so I think that was that moment that I was like, maybe, maybe I've been a little too harsh on church. It was a great conversation, and uh, it's ironic that we met at Chick-fil-A. Joey has his Starbucks cup, and he's never very far from the Starbucks cup. We should have met for coffee that morning, but it was a, it was a fortuitous meeting. Um, not long after Joey uh, came to be with us, Amy and I had started seeing some things in Joey and thinking, we need to get Joey to seminary. We think this would be a great fit for him. Not only would it be good for him, it would give us five years while he's in school that he could be our youth minister. <laughs> We were, we were interested in this, and one day Joey showed up, before we had the conversation, Joey showed up at Amy's office, and he said, do you have any of these books? And these were all seminary textbooks. And Amy said, why? And tell us why. What's going on? <laughs> um, I mean, it really didn't have anything to do with coming back from Cuba and meeting a certain someone while in Cuba, and I thought, maybe I do want to stick around for a few years, that someone turned out to be my future wife. Um, but, in, yeah, those, these first few months at Park Road were, I think, really interesting for me because I think I was, all, I was always really just curious and had a lot of questions. And, and I, I love both the spiritual stuff of, of being religious, but I also love the intellectual stuff and being able to sort of ask questions and uh, have doubts and sort of just be in community of, of people who are willing to sort of journey together, maybe never finding an answer. Um, and so, I mean, it's sort of funny because the chaplain at the time, Diane Mowry, who's the one who connected us, had sort of been poking, even when I was at Queens, sort of was poking at me about seminary. And I was like, why would I go study God for my master's. That sounds like a silly idea. And I was very stubborn. If you know me, I'm a pretty stubborn person. And so I had zero interest in that. Um, but as I found that these commu the community could be a place of asking questions and uh, wrestling with some of these difficult topics, I sort of started thinking maybe this is something I do want for my life. And, and I was really interested actually the reason I wanted to get my master's, something in diplomacy or peace and conflict or Nordic studies, was because I was really interested in the people aspect, the interfaith pieces, the intercultural pieces. And I thought you could only do that sort of through the, the political avenues and realized actually it's through seminary that you can really do that as well. And so being able to actually go back uh, or to sort of think through seminary and to consider that as an option um, and having these two sort of also poking and prodding and saying yes we uh, we would love for you to go and and imagining this different journey of, of five years in seminary and all the things that I could possibly do with that was pretty enticing um, and then I think also just being at Park Road uh, going on the Cuba trip it it also showed me the ways in which Park Road interacts with the world. And I think that was something that I was also really struggling with, was how does the church interact with people outside of the walls in different countries? And I was a little hesitant to go to Cuba because it was a mission trip, but it turned out actually when I um, went and saw, wow, this is just a group of people meeting up with another group of people and respecting each other. I started realizing that maybe this long-term commitment to faith communities is something I want to investigate. Joey, thinking about your story from rural West Virginia to Park Road Baptist Church and now being the chaplain at Queens University, you've had a pretty interesting journey. Tell us a little bit about that quickly and, and what some significant moments along the way. Very quickly. So, very long story short, seminary was uh, the perfect opportunity for me to sort of step back and, and actually reflect a little bit on the 25 years of my life. I think, for the most part, sort of 
the ways in which I was raised in that community. I just sort of ignored a lot of these theological things that I was struggling with. Um, and seminary sort of forced me to think about what do I believe and what do I think about God and my relationship with Jesus and what does it mean to follow Jesus and what does the church? So all these big questions sort of forced me um, to think about that. Many Saturdays in tears. I'm not a big crier, but let me tell you, the first two years of seminary, I, the amount of times I sat in y'all's office and just frustrated, angry, <laughs> learning all the things um, in tears, it was, it was interesting. Um, but I think it was, it was really important because what it allowed me to do was to think about the, the community that raised me and all the things that I appreciate about that and, and sort of looking back and thinking of the significance of my, my grandpa who was the center of, of faith for me and being able to appreciate her commitment to faith and, and thinking back at my time in you know, Pentecostal worship with my grandmother leading music um, and then my grandma actually never cut her hair and so it was always up and really neat uh, in a bun but after most worship services um, sort of seeing her filled with the Holy Spirit the amount of times I would like watch her run around the sanctuary and watching a lot of people running around the sanctuary and falling to the floor and just sort of after service, her hair would just be, you know, amok and, you know, to the ground. And, but just seeing the ways in which that, that faith grounded her, I think, was really significant for me. And also uh, community. Community was really important um, sort of in my own upbringing and, and thinking of a significant time for me when uh, one of my older brothers was struggling with drugs and alcohol and being able as an eight-year-old to come up and to an altar call and, and have like this whole congregation laying their hands on me and praying for me and, and my family was really significant and just learning that community is really important to get through some of the, the hard times in life. And so, so I think, you know, learning to appreciate but then also looking at the ways in which I struggled. Um, a, a major struggle for me is I have a lot of questions. And, and again, I'm pretty stubborn. And I really love dinosaurs. And why can no one explain to me, what, did Adam and Eve live with the dinosaurs? Where were the dinosaurs in Genesis? And this frustrated me so much because I just didn't understand. <laughs> I also didn't understand <laughs> another issue was, you know, when I was sitting in the pews thinking, well, you know, I, uh, all these people are speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit and running around and falling to the floor. I was not doing this. And as hard as I tried to sit in this pew as little nine-year-old Joey and force myself to speak in this foreign language, literally just gibbering off things so that I would fit in, you know, I... I think that had a lot of negative effects for me and that I didn't really address until I went to seminary and also therapy is really helpful as well. To think about all the, the self-negative talk um, that I gave myself for maybe not being quite good enough or you know, if I had questions, like questions were bad. And so I think seminary was able to ground me in ways that where I could appreciate my past but also sort of be able to let some things go, which was really important. Um, I don't even know, yeah. Last question. This is, That's it. this is Transfiguration Sunday. We read this story that I just read. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we read this story and we often hear it, and Christians often read this story and they think, wow, what a miracle that happened to Jesus. We, we think of this story often just as much about the miracle that happened to the disciples who were changed by Jesus. And so I wonder how you think about the word. When Amy and I talked about Transfiguration Sunday and interviewing somebody, who do we know who has been the most transformed? And we both said, Joey Haynes. How do you think about this story, Joey, and Transfiguration Transformation? So I'll keep it very brief, but when you first said this, maybe I'm, I really am a Baptist at heart. 
to keep it very brief, I actually read the Matthew version of this and not the Luke version. In the Matthew version, it actually talks about um, how fearful that the disciples were, and Jesus ended up coming and saying, do not be afraid. And so I think for me, I think I lived a long time in fear. Um, I lived in certainty. Like I knew everything was 100% certain, but yet had so much fear. And I think when I think about being transformed in just this idea of embracing liberation, embracing a message that is different than what you know and, and sort of trying to move from fear to freedom, I think has been really helpful for me. And, um, and being okay not knowing everything and, and also still embracing surprise from this story and being okay to be surprised by new things. We're so grateful for the transformation we've seen in Joey Haynes and for the transformation that he has worked in us and you and for his journey with us. And Joey, thank you for sharing with us this morning. Good to be here. Good luck, Amy. <laughs>
Okay, the first page is basically why I think Transfiguration Sunday is better than Christmas and Easter, but I'm going to skip explaining why I think that. But Transfiguration Sunday is my favorite religious day of the year. And I think it's a shame that Hallmark hasn't capitalized on this special religious day because if the world needs anything, they need to know that transformation is possible. Maybe it's hard for Hallmark to pick up on a story that ends with, they kept silent, and in those days, no one uh, said anything about what they had seen. That's a hard marketing campaign. Peter and John and James saw Jesus transfigured. His face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. And a reunion happened, and then a voice followed, My son, my chosen, listen to him. I wonder, who was transfigured, changed, transformed that day? Jesus or Peter and John and James? Have you ever had one of those experiences where something inexplicable happens? It's mysterious, it's baffling, maybe even a bit eerie, but something shifts, something turns, something changes, and the way you see the world, the way that you live in the world, the way that you respond to the world, the way that you engage the world is different. Some moment happens, celebratory or tragedy, and you are transformed. It does still happen. We are conditioned to give up hope and lose hope. We are trained to brace for the worst, we are prepared to believe that substantive change is not really possible in ourselves and in others. And we've come to accept that, well, old habits just die hard, and that's that, and we have to live with it. Enter Transfiguration Sunday. And it has shown up right on time this year. Exactly at the moment when the world needs most to hear that transformation and change is possible, we are given this gift of possibility, of a changed countenance and dazzling clothes and a voice that says, my chosen. Perhaps that's why we have come together today on a gloomy, rainy, cold Sunday, both outside with the weather and inside in the depths of our being as the world watches the agony of war and lives with the anxiety of what this will mean for them, for us. We have come here to be reminded that transfiguration is still possible. I need for you to embrace that. I want you to accept that. I want you to believe it. Just ask anyone that has been clean and sober for one day. And when those one day at a time string together to make one month, and when those one month at a time string together to make a year, or maybe two years, or maybe 30 years clean and sober, then tell me change isn't possible. We're not talking about probable. We're talking about possible. We get hung up with what's probable. That's how the world calculates in probabilities. The church calculates in possibilities. Just ask anyone who becomes educated. Watch that light bulb come on over someone's head and then watch them come alive when you learn to read and then when you sit at the feet of those who have something new to teach you and you sit there with an open mind to receive. Be careful because it is highly likely that you are going to be transfigured, changed, transformed. At least that's what happened to me. But for today, I want to tell you about what I witnessed at a lunch meeting this past Tuesday. I sat in a room of mostly clergy, the only white person there, and I listened for two hours to people testify to transfiguration. 
It was a gathering to support the Exodus Foundation, which is an organi organization whose sole purpose is to stop the flow of African Americans to prison. Here's their vision statement. To participate in creating a more sane, humane, and safe world where color and class discrimination cease to contaminate justice and its resources and punishment as the answer to criminal activity is replaced by atonement, reconciliation, restorative justice, and secured mental health treatment. It's a large vision. I don't have time to tell you all that I heard about the prisons, our prison system that is so very broken. I don't have time to tell you all that I learned about the difference in punishment and taking someone's life in prison. I don't have time to tell you about all the statistics of the injustice of a system that is designed to continue to fail those who have no one as an advocate working on their behalf. Depending on the color of your skin, what neighborhood you are from, and how much education you have, the justice system works differently for the haves and the have-nots. It works differently for white people than black people. If you don't believe that, you are not paying attention. But I want to tell you, I'm going to take the time to tell you about the man who spoke, who was about my age, his mid-50s, just eight months out of prison of serving 31 years of his life. He talked about being a stupid kid with no role models. He told about how he, his brother, his cousin, and his cousin's friend made a series of stupid mistakes that landed them in prison. And over the 31 years there, he changed. He got educated and he spent as much time as he could in the law library of the prison writing letters to Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and the Reverend B William Barber. And he never heard back from any of them. Somehow he connected with the Exodus Foundation who worked on his behalf and their behalf to get their sentence, their life sentence reduced to time served. He couldn't believe it. But he was standing there before us with a job and a passion to help others in prison system who have no one working on their behalf. He said punishment is necessary, but not taking someone's whole life for being a stupid kid. And the system is designed to take too many, especially black, lives. And then he said it. He said the one thing I needed to hear in a week feeling on the brink of another world war, in a week of losing hope, in a week leading up to my most favorite religious day of the year, Transfiguration Sunday, he said, I'm standing here today free for eight months after 31 years in prison to tell you that redemption is real and people can change. And I wrote it down because I knew last Tuesday at noon that that would be the title of this sermon today. Redemption is real. People can change. As this black man stood before me in a room of black clergy and me, I would swear to you that the appearance of his face changed. And his clothes were dazzling. And he appeared in glory in this company of clergy. And a voice came that said, this is a son of mine. Listen to him. And right then and there, I believed yet again in the power of God to transfigure, to change, to transform lives. And I beg of you, believe it with me. Please, for the love of God, believe people can change. Redemption is possible, even when it's not probable. We do not live as Christians on probability. We live on possibility. Believe it. Believe it. Live like you believe it. Talk about it. Be it. Come on, y'all. We can be transfigured. Everybody can. 
May it be so. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, today we pray for peace. Our hearts go out this morning to the people of Ukraine and we lift them up to you in prayer. We pray for the more than 150,000 Ukrainian refugees who have already fled to neighboring Poland, Romania, and Moldova, taking with them little more than they were wearing and what they could carry in their arms. We pray that the humanitarian aid these countries can provide will ease the plight of these refugees who have been forced to flee their own country. We lift up to you, especially all of those innocent civilians who were unable to flee and who are now enduring violent attacks. May they be aware of your presence, even in their darkest moments. We pray for peace. We pray for Russians and Ukrainians, that together they may find a way to end this conflict through negotiation. We recognize, O oh God, that even though this conflict is taking place in another part of the world, it makes us anxious. 
anxious because it involves Russia, one of the world's superpowers. Anxious because it can have economic and political repercussions worldwide, even for us. Anxious because personally, we are powerless to put an end to it. We pray for peace, not only in Ukraine, but in the more than 20 countries in the world that are currently experiencing armed conflict, particularly Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Yemen, countries where over 10,000 people have died in the past year. Gracious God, even as we pray for peace, we know that peace is what you desire. And so we join our hearts with yours. Help us to be peacemakers in our own small ways and in our own circles of influence. Finally, grant us peace in our own lives, a peace that is not dependent on outward circumstances, but a peace that comes from you and that goes beyond our own understanding. We ask these things in the name of your Son, who is called the Prince of Peace. Amen.
I'm so bummed we saved this hymn at the end of this sermon series because it's so awesome. But we're only going to sing the very last verse of it. But you have to promise to take your bulletin home and read the other three verses because it's so good to wrap up this sermon series about calling. So if part of your calling during this epiphany season has been to become a member of a church, we invite you to join us as we sing the last verse of Will You Come and Follow Me? may be seated. Our hope and prayer is that you experience transformation this week and that you hold out that hope for everybody that you come in contact with. The final word is not ours but the Lord, so hear this good word of benediction as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and may God be gracious to you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. That you might do justice to love with all your soul, that you might show mercy, to love with all your mind, that you might walk humbly with your God. As you go into the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen.